Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Really happy to see all of you here. So thank you very much. Really appreciate that. And today we are going to talk about testing and how we can continuously test our Drupal distributions. So this is our topic. Welcome. And hello, my name is Alex Shadrov. I came here from Ukraine. I work at the FFW as team lead and architect and also We'll, we are building open wide distribution, so potentially you may hear something about that. And here is my contact information in case you will, if you would like to catch up on some things. My blog, I write articles about technologies, events, and stuff like that, so welcome. And this talk is going to be based on the experience that we've got from the open wide distribution. So that's the Drupal 8 distribution with all fancy things like composers, decoupled things, integrations. So this talk is completely based on this experience. So in case if you haven't took a look on the open wide, there is a repository on, uh, on the GitHub. So let's get started. And today I'm going to talk about our continuous integration server and our continuous testing for this distribution and about his evolution. And all we know, yeah, that's the, that's the fact that every project starts from the first commit. When we are so excited, we create new folder, we, like, we, uh, we run git init, git commit, and just push, and here we go. So we have empty repository. We promise that we will cover everything uh, with tests, so 100% test coverage. We are so excited, but then we realize that Instead of writing codes, we need a little bit more. We, are, we need a little bit more tools in order to keep distribution stable, in order to test some specific features. Because writing code, it's like it's okay, it's day to day, day to day work. But testing, this is something excited. And with that, when we created open wide distribution, when we pushed our first commit, we realized that we need a little bit more. And the first problem was how to react to proposed changes. So we have our team at the FFW. There are also some teams in other agencies who are working on the distribution. So we have to somehow react to created pull requests on GitHub. So then we came up with an idea of using open source product that's called CA Box. And CA Box is just Jenkins plus some customization on top of it. So when I say CI server, just think about it as just Jenkins instance for the distribution. So if you take a look at the software that we are using, so the first one that Jenkins, it's just kind of worker. He's looking at something and he's doing something. Also we are using pull request builder plugin. Uh, that's the Jenkins plugin. I know there is pipeline and you might think that, come on buddy, there is Jenkins 2 pipelines, but yeah, we are all cool guys. We are using Jenkins and pull request builder because we've started our distributions, distribution like more than one year ago. And also, also we are using GitHub user in order to give an access from Jenkins to GitHub. And actually Jenkins will be able to take a look at pull requests, uh, post comments and do different stuff on GitHub. And how eventually CI is triggered. So the first step, uh, pull request is created. Let's say you found a bug that buttons shouldn't be red, it should be blue. So you commit your code, you create a pull request on GitHub. Then CI server pulls that code from your, from your pull request to some server. It doesn't matter like the destination, but it just pull the code. Then then the most important phase, he can perform some actions on this code. Analyze, do something, and then generate a report based on this, and eventually developer will get this report on GitHub. So he created pull request, then Jenkins chime in, do everything, and then developer will get the report on GitHub. So if you take a look at, the, at our CA server, OpenWise server, it's, it's, it's pretty small. It's just digital ocean droplet for $20 per month. It's, it's small, it's like nothing. So we have Jenkins, we have two CPU, two gig memory, 40 uh, gigabyte SSD, and also Ubuntu as operation system. 
And for, for all this automation, we are using Ansible. In case if you're not familiar with Ansible, I really encourage you to, to try this thing because it will just change your life forever. There is no way back from Ansible to Bosch, so just, just try it. So now, we have a tool to do something. So you remember that, that, that step when we can perform some actions. So, and we need something to perform actually on the code that has been pulled from GitHub. So our next step was to add code sniffers. So the problem that we were trying to solve to keep code base according to standards. Since we're building open source product, we should be really on the same page with, with everyone, with contributors, with the community. So we have to have code sniffers. So in our case, we've had PHP code sniffer, Drupal code sniffer uh, from Drupal coder module, JS hint in order to check JavaScript code, and SCSS lint in order to like take a look at the our theme, how it how it was built, and stuff like that. So and try to to write it in the right way. What we verify with this with this sniffers? First of all, we check our installation profile because all we know that this draw is just installation profile. We check uh, custom modules and custom themes. We do not care about contrips and core and everything that is kind of third party libraries, jQuery plugins, just we check everything that we actually create. And here is a response that developer actually gets whenever he creates a pull request. So that's the response from our bot, from our CI server, and we see that there are some reports and links to artifacts. So in this specific case, we have two errors from PHP sniffer, we have a few errors from JS hint, and a lot of errors from another JS hint in theme JS files. And this is the artifact file. So whenever a developer opens those links, he will just see the output from, from the sniffer, uh, sniffer, uh, applica sniffer tool. So, and in this case, when we see that there are plenty of errors, we just say, hey buddy, go back to work and fix all of them and then ask for a review. But in general, we have a rule. So whenever a developer creates a pull request, he should make sure that there is no errors and then ask for a review. And yeah, that's, that's the way how it works. But you may think that, all right, there is a Jenkins, there is some plugins, authentication, digital ocean for 20 bucks. So if there is something that I can just enable in a few clicks, yes, there is, but they are not as customizable as custom Jenkins. And the first one called Code Climate. So there is, there is service that provides code sniffers for you for some subscriptions, so they provide subscriptions, and for open source, they provide kind of free, free subscriptions. So this tool might look at your repository, they may generate some fancy badges for your tools that we may put in the readme.md file, but it doesn't support Drupal yet. So it works with Python, PHP, JavaScript, but there is no Drupal, and I, I, I know that Somewhere in their support, there is a ticket to apply like Drupal coder standards and stuff like that, but there is no support yet. And another thing, uh, another service, Codacy. So the same idea as Code Climate badges, like pull requests and stuff like that, and uh, again, subscriptions. So in case if you're looking for something like less customizable and more easy in configuration, so take a look at those two things. And eventually, eventually we've got sniffers in order to make our open source distribution better because everyone will be looking at it, and in case if we have something not according to standards, everyone will blame us for that, and we'll say that here is like bad code, what, 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 what are you doing? So that was only second step, and the third step builds so we've applied kind of sniffers, we were happy for a few days, and then realized that we need a place to test our changes. And the main idea was that we should test distribution before merging to master branch. Let's take a look at the example with drupal.org. 
Whenever someone creates issue, whenever someone submits patch, we should load it, apply locally, and then just do something, test it, and report feedback back. Of course, there is unit testing, but unit testing cannot like test color for the button or general appearance or stuff like that. So we have to download this patch. There is no environment. We have to download Docker, Vagrant, or something like this. So there is, you have to spend a lot of time to test it. With builds, it's like more easily to test it because you will have a builds and pull requests. So we've started from the installation profile. Before releases, before everything, we just uh, started from installation profile. And you may, you may have a question. Isn't it just simple drush site install command? Yes, but no. Because it's not just simple drush install, we have to perform a lot of actions, like prepare fol folders, add some comments to settings, PHP, enable some modules. So there are plenty of things that should be actually executed. And here is the process. Here is the process how we actually build the installation, the installation profile uh, on pull requests. So first step, we pull the code, we create some necessary folders for files, set appropriate permissions. Then we go to drush sign install. A simple comment in order to install the, the, the distribution. Then, of course, we add some post settings to settings PHP, like we have to specify some cache settings, we have to specify like memcache settings, varnish settings, and stuff like that. Then we go to modules and drush. Let's say we have to change the password for admin, or we have to enable devil module, or disable something, or enable db lock. So we do this at this phase, and then, only then, we generate report and send it to GitHub. Then at some point, we've had a requirement that we should add some steps to the installation process. That's the default process when you go through installation steps and like set up database and stuff like that. So we had to create an environment for that because our QA and we are didn't want to spin up environments locally. So we, we've had a requirement to add additional step to this form. So after all default Drupal steps, we had to add additional step. And we are lazy. We didn't want to pull code locally and just imagine how, how we would need to explain this to QA and to someone who, who will test this. Like clone the code, set up environment. So we, we really wanted to have this in the pull requests. Process, almost similar. So first step, code folders permissions. Then, magic trick to create empty database. Then, add credentials manually to settings PHP, and then send the report. Whenever you have empty database and you have credentials and settings PHP, this step with setting up database will be just skipped. So, you choose language, verify requirements will just skip, set up database will be skipped, and you will just install the website. So, that's that's pretty simple, however, it will give you an ability to test the installation process separately. So we were happy, we were building a distribution, and at some point we did a first release. So we, 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 we drank some beer after that, we were hanging out, we were happy, but we realized that we need an environment. One more environment, like one more thing for, for that distribution. So we were talking about this, and the question was, should we really test all hook updates that we are, that we are writing? And yes, of course we are, we, we should, because this is the most complicated thing in Drupal, and this is the most important thing in Drupal, that's the support for already existing websites in, if they are using your distro. So for that, we set up additional environments, and the process pretty similar. Pre settings, then magic step with importing SQL dump to the database. So after release, we have a rule. Once we do a release, we just create SQL dump based on this release. And on top of it, like different layers, we add hook updates on pull requests. So we have kind of previous version, it's kind of emulating a real website that client might have. So we import the SQL dump, run drush update DB, add some post settings. Enable modules and send a report to the developer. 
And here is how a report looks like. So we send three links to the developer. First one for fresh OpenWire installation, the second one for upgrade path and installation process. So you open the first one, you have the fresh installation of the distro. You open the second one, you have installation of distro plus all updates, hook updates that were created from the previous release. And you have installation steps. So as I mentioned, we are using Ansible. And this is just like uh, example how we, how we write uh, scripts on Ansible. There is a link in case if you'd like check out the whole, like the whole folder with scripts, please go ahead and do that. And this is our main script for builds. So we, we have general playbook and we just include other playbooks. It's like just split out code into different, different files. So for a vanilla installation, we're using steps where we specify uh, credentials, prepare environment, install, uh, distro using profile, then modules, then rush. So that's it. Then we have upgrade path. We just skip the profile and we enable the SQL workflow Ansible playbook. And for the installation step, the simplest one, we just create settings PHP, create empty database, and here we go. We are ready to go. And of course, credentials and settings PHP. So with this diversity of builds, our QA is happy. Our developers are happy because they do not care about local environment anymore whenever they are reviewing something. They just open the pull request. Make sure that there is no accessibility prob uh, sniffer problems. Make sure that there is no problems on the builds. So they merge pull request and then like it, it appears in the master branch that will be eventually released. But again, that wasn't enough. So at some point, we've had new functionality that should be super stable. So we added behead tests to that in order to cover primary functions and primary features that we've had in the distro. So we've added user acceptance testing, a KB hat. Uh, most of us are familiar with this, and most of us are we're trying to actually add B hat tests, and we were trying to do that in real projects. However, like only on destroy it, it shows the really good results with that. So our our approach was to uh, create and integrate the head test once vanilla build is ready. So that build from just the installation profile, we just run B head test. So B head will go through necessary pages and make sure that everything fine or everything completely failed. So we are using Composer in order to add B head to your projects or to your distros. You have to add Drupal driver, Drupal extension, B head, Mink, Gautia driver, but Last two, they are, not, uh, they are not required, they are optional. So the first one is just generate really cool reports. I will show them a little bit later. And the last one, it contains a few cool things and features that are not available in Drupal extension by default. So in case if you're using behead, take a look at this. Then we have to create behead.yaml. In behead.yaml, we specify context, so actually those libraries that we are going to use in our test suites. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. Again, there are always link to the distro. Also, in case you would like to take a look at the code, open it and take a look. And this is Ansible playbook. That's the beginning of our Ansible playbook that we're using for, for automation. That's just list of variables. But the important part here that we are using Docker for Selenium, so in order to run JavaScript tests, so actually tests that will go and do something on a page, we are using Docker and Selenium container. So that's the beginning of actual tasks that this playbook will go through. We wait for Selenium container to be stopped. You may think, what the heck is this? It means that we run only one single container. We do not run multiple containers for different builds. So let's say we have two builds. We run container for the first one, it will run behead tests, then we stop it, and the second one will be run after that. So we do not, don't, don't want to run multiple containers because they will eat memory, they will add like disk space and stuff like that, and we are just lazy to implement that right now because it's not that important. So tasks, 
In tasks, we run Selenium container for current build. Then we'll wait for Selenium container to be actually run. Then we run full behead tests in case, in case if we would like to run headless tests plus JavaScript tests, or we would like run just headless tests separately. And those two commands, they will actually generate report that will be available for some link. And in post tasks, we just stop container and remove that container. And here is how the report looks like for the developer. Just simple link, simple link to something like this. This is the report from BHAT. In case if we have some, everything green, that's good. In case if we have something red, that's very bad and you have to get back to work and fix that. Until that, your pull request will never be merged into the master branch, sorry. Sounds good, right? Sounds good, BHAT, accessibility sniffers, builds, but it was very slow. So BHAT tests that we've developed only for a few features, they like they 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 take 30 minutes in order to just finish BHAT tests. That's that's not the way how, how we were going to go with, with BHAT tests because we have to wait 30 minutes and only then we can we can like analyze if this pull request should be merged or not. So here is an example of simple feature that we have in the in the distro. So that's the membership calculator page. We have three steps. On the first step, we select the membership type. On the second step, we select location. And the third step is just confirmation step where we just show the map, location info, and membership type, and complete registration as will lead you to third-party service. So just simple form, three steps. But in order to create BHAT test for this, we have to generate media images, then create location nodes, so from the list that was selected, then create membership content types, then create paragraphs, then create one more paragraph that, is, that will wrap all that stuff, then create landing page and embed that specific component that will render this page and only then we can run tests. Just imagine how much time we had will go through all these forms and fill them out or just imagine how many code you should write in order to use Drupal extension to generate this content using just built-in BHAT, BHAT stuff. So there were problems. References by IDs, so there is no way to easily handle that. Duplicated code, slow tests, and complicated maintenance for that because we just will copy and paste our tests in order to generate just the basic content. So we decided to just write custom BHAT context for that. And this context should really generate content for us and we wanted to split out generating content and test suits itself. So generating content, it's not a part of test itself because it's something separate. It's something that will be used in tests but it's not test itself. Let's say we create a page and we wanna make sure that on this page we wanna see label and image. We wanna see label and image, that's the test. Creating content and creating some page, that not the test, that just preparation for tests. So we created custom context where we have a few, just a few methods that accept a lot of different parameters, but eventually they generate content for us and it's easy to maintain that. So here is an example how we use that context. In the background, in BHAT background, it means that it's not a test, it's a background for a test. In background, we generate all this content, and there is a really complicated fields like field location. So we, it accepts country code, address line, locality, area, postal code, and stuff like that. So it's really complicated field. However, like visually, when we look at this, we understand that it's content. It's not a test itself. So we create branch, paragraphs, media items, landing page, and then we are anonymous users we are ready to perform tests. And our tests look very, very simple. So we have a content, we, we know that we already have a content. So we just go through steps and verify what we should see on the page. And in this way, it's really easy to maintain. It's 
easy to work with that and it's like easy to generate new tests because let's say we created a new feature. We already know that we should have now the image and some paragraphs. We just write this, these fancy tables and that's it. But there may be some problems with debugging in case if you are performing JavaScript tests. So debugging, debugging is important and when we use JavaScript tests, we really wanna see what the Selenium is doing. And for that, I, I would like to suggest using standalone Chrome Docker container with debug suffix. It means that it might be used for debug, so let's say you are using this container, and there is a great tool called RealVNC. RealVNC, that's the application that allows you to connect to some remote, remote uh, screens. You have a container, kind of remote screen, you have a tool to connect to it. So you just specify IP address, port, and you will see everything that Behat is doing. So he's clicking on some things, like slideshow is changing his slides. So you will see everything on the screen with this, with this tool. It's a really cool thing for the debugging. So with Behat tests, we covered the behavior part we covered the, important, the most important part of the distro, let's say, membership page. Membership page for the YMCs, for the open wise, almost the most important part because this is the place where cost, new customers are joining their branches. So we covered primary functionality. But again, guess what? That wasn't, that wasn't enough. So we were going deep and deep with tests and with distro building. So second thing that we applied after BHAT tests, we added the accessibility sniffers. And we need them in order to check theme accessibility because we are working with nonprofit organizations. So YMCA's, this is the largest nonprofit organization in the United States. They have many different associations that they really need accessible websites. They really need accessible websites because they really care about people with accessibility problems. So that was the challenge for us to create the accessibility distro. And in order to kind of create good, uh, good uh, framework in order to create accessible theme, we were using the HTML code sniffer. That's just the tool that checks HTML markup according to some standards. There are uh, web content accessibility guidelines built in in this tool, so you just have to install it using Composer, and you can use it and just verify some pages. And we did that. Here is our playbook that we are using. So yeah, we are using a lot of playbooks. Again, link there. In variables, we just specify a list of the most important pages that we would like to check for the accessibility. And then in the loop, we go through the, this page, these pages and check them for accessibility. So, and this is the report that developer eventually will get. So he will get a lot of comments on GitHub, yes, but they are important, they are always important. So, oops. Whenever developer opens these artifacts, these links, he will see something like this. So we will have a list of, we will have an output from that HTML sniffer we will have a lot of problem there. We will have some errors and warnings and notices. In our case, like in, in, in all cases, it's impossible to just clean up that list because it will be huge. There will be tons of these errors and warnings, like 1,000, uh, 1, 2,000, 20,000 warnings. And that's okay because we really have to care about errors because errors the most important part of this, of this report because they will really block the people from visiting the websites. They will really block blind people from being able to navigate through the website. They will really block someone from being able to use the content of your website. So we have a rule that pull requests shouldn't be merged whenever we have these errors. Warnings, that's okay. So with that tool, we achieved the accessibility uh, we actually created accessible theme. It's not fully accessible because it's, it's kind of impossible to create accessible theme that will match, uh, that will actually solve the problems of everyone. However, that's the good like foundation, 
for creating more accessible websites. Based on this, we've performed some testing with blind community. We've performed some testing with people who are using the website with accessibility problems. But from technical perspective, that's awesome foundation for building accessible themes and front end and designs. But after this, we realized that our builds like took one hour to generate builds, to run BIAT tests, apply accessibility and code sniffers, and that was insane because you just create pull requests and you have to wait one hour in order to make sure that there is no error. So you have two options. First one, just sit and wait, and everyone, whenever someone asks you what are you doing, you may say that you're waiting for a build. That's a good excuse. Or that will block you during your working day because you have to create pull requests, switch to something else, then switch back, then like fix one tiny error or type on your code and then wait one hour more. So that's, that was insane. So we came up with an idea how we can speed up our builds, how we actually can accelerate our builds and improve them. So we wanted to convert them from something like this do something like this, so they, be, they, they should be really, really, really fast. And the main idea is pretty simple. So we split out everything that I've just outlined to primary build and other secondary, not important builds that are only for geeks and like technical guys and stuff like that. So primary build, that's the Drupal installation. This is something that we're really building and this is something that our distribution should do. Other builds, Accessibility, BHAT, other builds, they are secondary. They are important, but they are secondary. So, and we wanted to run them in parallel. Here is an example how, how it was working. So we generate primary build. Once it's ready, we send a comment to GitHub. We set status on GitHub. Then we trigger all secondary builds. They are running in parallels. And whenever some, someone is ready, he will just send a new comment. So it looks like you create a pull request. In 10 or 15 minutes, you get a uh, comment with three links to vanilla, great boss, and installation steps. You open these builds, you click something, you verify that it's working, and then new comments pop up in your pull request. And then when you finish testing with the real build, you just make sure that everything is fine here. Since we are old school guys, we are not using pipelines in, from Jenkins, so and at that point, when we developed this, there were no ability to actually change the status somehow out of the box from pull request builder, so we had to do this manually. <laughs> That's, that might be scary. No worries. I, sometimes even I do not understand what does it mean. Like I, I spend 30 like, seconds or a few minutes to understand, but it's, it's really simple. We just generate JSON, and we use curl in order to send this JSON to GitHub API using bot name and token. It's, it's simple and cool thing, cool thing that like will blow your mind. That's the application called Jaw. It might generate JSON files right from your CLI. So all those variables, they will be placed in pending JSON and you may just say to curl that here is JSON. That's the cool thing. Instead of creating the whole the, the really big JSON in your Bosch, just that application does that. So that's how we actually set a status on GitHub. Here is an example of how we run tests. So Ansible, we go to folder, we execute Ansible playbook test.yaml, generate JSON, set up status, generate JSON, post comments. So it's, it's, it, it's really easy, but that code is hard to understand. Yeah, I know that. I am so sorry for that. <laughs> but it works. It brings that value that we really need. So, but there is always but. There is always but, so that's life. Because Jenkins, whenever something is failed in your job, Jenkins will just stop your job. Jenkins will not proceed with anything that is like below that failed job. And in order to set failed status, we did that trick with plugin called post build task. This plugin allows you to run something even though your job has been failed. 
And with this, let's see, we have a lot of different playbooks. We run them separately, and the first playbook has been failed. In this case, we say it's okay, it might be failed, we will check it later. At, at the end, we just go through console output and verify if there is a word mark build as failure, if there is a word was aborted or failed, we just send the failed status to GitHub like this. So you've seen this code, but just with a pending status. In case if we found something in the console output, we just set failed status. And here is our build timeline after all those improvements. So we split out our job and we split out our Jenkins uh, stuff into different builds. So our main build approximately takes 15 minutes because we have to install Drupal, import the SQL database, trash update DB, stuff like that. After this, we just run other builds. Let's say accessibility sniffer takes like 30 minutes, depends on the list of the pages. Sniffers takes 30, oh sorry, accessibility sniffers 30 seconds, sniffers 30 seconds, behead tests up to 15 minutes, depends on the uh, number of concurrency builds. So that was new timeline. Looks good, that's for me, because in comparison to one hour, one hour delay in your pull request, it's, it's really good result. And here is like a list of statuses that we get on GitHub after this improvement after lazy builders. So default, in default we have vanilla installation, uh, grid pass installation, installation steps, plus sniffers. So this is something that we should separate from, from the default job. And we have behead tests and accessibility tests. And here is how the failed status look like. In case if we something red, we just see it's not acceptable, go and work on it again. But the main thing from that we main thing that we learned from this, when we split out into different jobs, we realized that now we have an entry point for new tests for new jobs. So we have the primary thing. We can add uh, secondary jobs and we can add them as many as we want. And that's the great thing. And now we are working on so exciting things, so I wanted to share them with you as well. So now I'm, I'm going to talk about what we are working right now and potentially in a few weeks, maybe after DrupalCon, this will be also available, so we can just visit OpenY and take a look at the code and reuse it. Decoupled tests. So decoupled is a word that came to our lives from Drupal 8. And since we're like crazy technical guys, we realized that we need something really fun and really interesting. So we wanted to challenge ourselves to uh, create good product. So we came up with an idea of, of using decoupled tests. And decoupled tests, it's mean that we really wanted to, to test the distribution and its components separately from the distro itself. So we are using component-based architecture in the distribution. It means that every component that we render on the page, it's something separate. It's not the like monolithic system. It's something separate. The component is separate. And here is just a rough diagram. Do not pay attention to this part. Just like take a look from, from your side how big the system is. And those are not all components. We have like hundreds of components, and they are small and big and middle, so we, main point that we have a lot of components. And we wanted to test every single component separately from the distro. So we came up with an idea how to do that. So first step, we just select a module from the list of modules that we actually wanna test. Then we install Drupal using testing profile. Then we get a list of modules before installation, then install module, get a list of modules after installation, create difference between before and after, and then go back and select another module. You might be wondering what the heck is this? What are you, what, where you will use this data and these reports? So it's really easy what we will get from this report. First, we will see how much dependencies, how many dependencies each component will have. 
So let's say you've specified some dependencies uh, in your info file, but eventually when you enable this module, it has so much more, so many more uh, modules that should be enabled. So with this report, we will see that identify unnecessary dependencies. We will see if components are ready for being used on other projects because we have a lot of cool things that may be reused just on clients projects like media features, some landing page wizards, templates and stuff like that. And since we are using OP, object-oriented programming, we can check coupling and cohesion. So those two criteria, they, they actually show how your objects are ready for being used in another system or they are not ready and they are embedded into your system so it's really hard to decouple them from, from, from your system. Ansible playbook that we are using. That's the master playbook that just go through the list of modules and include another playbook. So just, that's kind of just worker that will go through the list of, list of modules and pass some additional variables to the uh, another playbook. Uh, there is no link, it's not available yet. However, I hope that we will have time to finish that. So in another playbook, really simple, Drush PML that will show you a list of modules, then Drush uh, module enable, then we just check, uh, check if module has been enabled at all because there might be some use cases when module will not be enabled without another one that hasn't been specified in dependencies. Then we do Drush PML after, and then we create a diff. So our goal and our idea to have report like this, we will have module, we will have status, it will demonstrate if module has been enabled at all, and we will have a list of dependencies. So you may see that OpenY Media Image hasn't been enabled separately on testing profile. It means that we did something wrong with it and we should check it, make sure that it's decoupled. But there is a list of dependencies. So you may wonder how we, how we may use this. As example, team lead on, or architect, they may just quickly go through this list of dependencies and as example, we have open why not landing. We have meta tag and scheduler. Scheduler sounds like separate feature, right? It, it's not the part of content type itself. So we may notice that meta tag should be part of SEO feature, like search engine optimization, and scheduler should be part of separate feature. Instead of those two modules, first, we should specify dependency on these features is EO or scheduler, or we should get rid of these dependencies from here. So it's, there is no obvious solution for the developers how to react to this report. However, it will give architect and team lead uh, some, uh, some data to think about how the modules can be better uh, decoupled from the distro. Yeah, yeah, we are crazy. We're working on some kind of stuff from time to time in order to get some uh, in, in order to bring some fun into our lives, and that's true, but with that, we may create really sustainable distribution and modules and components might be reused. So you may just reuse it on, on, on your own projects that you're building for the clients. Why we should like create over and over that media feature? Because we already have it well tested with a good design, with the good stuff in the distro. So we want to make sure that if we pick it from the distro and enable somewhere, it will work. But that wasn't enough again. So we came up with regression testing because just imagine like from the first release up until like 1.4 and 1.5, the distro like grew up. We've had plenty of pages that should be tested and our QA just burned out because he every time he has to go and just compare pages if there is any regressions. Just imagine how miserable his life was during that time. So he, he had to open a lot of builds, he had to just compare them, that's insane. So, and we started working on the regression testing. So it's, it's, it's really simple in implementation, however, 
it might be very difficult in implementation as well. And here is a workflow how we do that. First, we set up a list of pages that we would like to check for regressions. Second, we just generate a list of screenshots from primary environment. You may just have some dev server that you can treat as a primary environment. And whenever we generate new builds, we just compare these screenshots. We just compare them using BHAT extensions. So there are two extensions that may help you with that. First one, BHAT screenshot compare. From name, we can figure out that it will help you to compare screenshots. The second one, BHAT screenshot. It's obvious that it takes just it, it just takes screenshots. So, yeah, those two, those two, we had to composer JSON or just composer require and uh, specify those two libraries, and then we had to a little bit just or be at YAML. We had to specify those those extensions and a few configurations like where we should save our screenshots on failure on failure uh, whenever we compare them and stuff like that. So. Then we create a just custom method in order to simplify saving on screenshots in order into specific directory. So, and here is how the BHAT test, BHAT feature look like. So first two lines, they are triggered on primary environment. So first one will just remove all screenshots and then take screenshots from primary environment. The second or uh, third, third uh, part of this script it will just compare different screenshots. So it, it's, it's really simple, but it will show you really uh, things that you might not notice just by comparison to pages. And here is how updated report look like. In, in addition to the link to be had to that be had fancy report with green circles, we just send the link to directory where we have screenshots. And here is an example of a report from BHAT where we compare screenshots. So screenshot compare has been failed. We see that homepage doesn't match the new homepage. And eventually, screenshot of, of regression will look like this. It's okay that we updated menu items. That's totally fine, right? But we see that margin was completely changed. In case if it's fine, we can say that it's completely fine. I'm gonna merge this pull request. In case if we have something really crazy going on with the page, we can notice this here. And it's, it's, it's cool because we do not, do not have to open primary environment, current environment, and just compare them. So it will show you on the builds right away. But in case if you would like to have less customizable option, or you have no time to play with BHAT, or you, have, or you need something really, like you need quick solution, there is a service called backtrack.io. It was created by my ex-colleagues and friends. So this service allows you to generate and compare different environments, even with production. So just take a quick look on it in case if you would like to catch regression bugs. And with custom implementation, we actually will be able to catch this bug. So it's in progress. We are working on this, however, we will, we will implement this very soon. And the last piece of this that we are working right now, it's completely kind of breakthrough, at least for us, for our team, for our technical team. So that's TDD testing. That's TDD testing based on unit testing. And we need that in order to test third party integrations. And in the distro we have a lot of different third party integrations because YMCAs, they are using different services for different stuff like schedules, personal trainings, and, and stuff like that. So we found a way how we can perform unit testing on a real database. So instead of installing Drupal from testing profile and test everything there, we can install the profile using, install this to using our profile and test everything there, or we can in, if we're talking about projects with clients, we can take the database from prod production and perform test there. So live database, that's the main, the main difference from usual unit tests. And I would like to say kudos to those two guys who actually came up with this idea. One of them is here. So in case if you will have any questions, just ping him instead of me. He is the, 
kind of he's the creator of this masterpiece that we are working on right now. So his name is Dmitry Danilevsky, and another one is Andrei Pananka. So thank you guys for this idea. Let's take a look at example. So example is really complicated. So we are building integration with third-party services. First, we should get the data from REST service. Second, we should process that data. Since third-party services, they are not always as friendly as we expect. Based on this data, we have to scrape website HTML markup and get additional data. That's insane, but whenever we create integration with third-party services, they do not have everything that we need. So we have to find the workarounds how we, how we can work with that. Then we get data from REST service once again, perform calculations, go to the next step of the form, and once again, so just imagine how complicated this from the technical perspective from, from the development perspective. But from user perspective, it looks really simple. So here is a form. Select type, select location, select school, then select program, then select read, and here you go you will be just right directed to another link to some third party service. It looks simple. What, like, why do we have so like, difficult and complicated backend? The reason for that, because third party services. And I'm pretty sure that if you've had created integration with third party services, you understand my pain that I'm talking about right now. So those two guys, they came up with an idea of TDD unit testing. This is the module that contains only like most important parts that the Drush file, that's the services file, and source folder with the three services, and just file with some basic configuration. And I'm, I hope that at some point this module will be published in Drupal.org. If you need something like this, ping that guy, just push him to publish this module in Drupal.org so everyone can reuse it. By default, it provides a few Drush commands. First one, it allows you to run these unit tests. Second one, you can run tests that will actually perform requests to third-party services, collect data, and save this data in the specific file, like create a mock for your test. So when you will run test once again, instead of pinging third-party service, it will use data from mock file. So you can enable, disable some tests, and you can set that mock data manually. So this is the trash comments. And next slide is like completely blew out my mind when I saw it. It's the masterpiece in programming, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> like this is it. So that's the. That's the unit tests for, for a live database. We bootstrap Drupal, we load some additional classes, we load PHP unit, we like reflect those libraries, we add our test suite, and we run these tests on live database. Let's say you have database within use. You pull them from third party service, and you can perform these tests on your, on your live environment with this, with this awesome class and method. And here is how the test look like itself. So it's, it looks pretty similar to unit tests in Drupal. We have a list of methods. The first one, we just want to make sure that whenever we get categories from third party services, our code will process them in the right way. And the second one, based on previously, uh, previous category that we've got, Whenever we send a request to third party, our code will process this data in the right way. And the same with registration link. Here we test only our code. We do not care about third party service because we are not developers from third party service. We want to test only our code. And this is how we are doing this. This is the way how we can run it. We can run it using Drush. We can run it using just PHP code through devil PHP. And with these tests, we can mock data from the third party API. We can help, they can be helpful for the team because even your QA can run them using devil PHP. It's time saving because you need only a few seconds to run them instead of be at and one hour. 
and it's easy to debug. Let's say you're building this form for the integration with Servati. You just, in order to get to the last step, you have to go and click a lot of different options. With PHP unit, you set breakpoint, you run rush command, in one second you're already in this breakpoint. That's, that's the breakthrough as for me, like for our team, because it like speed up the team working hours. It's just, you feel like you're doing something really cool instead of just functional programming and functions and alters and stuff like that. So this is our setup of CI for OpenWide Distro. And you may reuse it. Just ping me if you need any additional information. So I just wanted to summarize everything. So we have CI, lazy builders, sniffers, builds, PHAT tests, accessibility sniffers, and right now we are working on some really exciting stuff like decouple tests, visual regression, and unit tests. So here is our, our goal. That's the desired list of statuses for pull requests. So we have we would like to split out everything into different jobs and we would like to add a time at the end of the status description. So that's it. I really wish you to do not fix bug, do not fix bug later, fix them right now. Try to identify them before they appeared in some production environment. So happy testing everyone. Join tomorrow for contribution sprints. Thank you very much. That's the time for questions and answers. Please evaluate session. Thank you very much. Any questions? There is a microphone in case you would like to ask something. <laughs> Hello. Good session. Uh, my question is about the default content that you create. You only create it in the BHAT test, or you make some kind of default content available for a QA team or something like that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. At the very beginning, we decided how we will go with the default content because whenever we install the website, it's just empty. There is nothing to test. So we came up with the idea, and actually this guy at Metro was working on this. We're using Migrate module in order to generate content. And the main idea that we have set up of YAML files with the content, so they just we, we've split out everything into entities. So we have YAML file with images. We have YAML file with nodes for locations. We have YAML files for blogs. Well, then we have YAML files for landing pages, paragraphs, and Migrate module just build everything and assemble everything and just create the content when we install the distro. So in case if you would like, take a look at the examples. So just came in after session, I can like. No, it's amazing because I have a contrib module that is called migrate default content that it exactly does, does yeah, the same Yeah, 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 actually, yeah. We, we, we noticed that module once we already implemented this, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you for your question. Hi, thank you for a great uh, session. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what about projects based on open wide distribution? So the first question is like, uh, on what repository like and hosting they are hosted and like what kind of this test that you described you run on this like an enterprise project actually yep. based on distro. Yeah, so you, you heard we're using CI box as kind of our internal tool, but that's just simple Jenkins plus some Ansible playbooks. So on the enterprise websites that we're building, we're usually using only builds and in some cases, we're using BHAT or unit tests. And in case if client requires have accessibility, we can easily set up that. So like, it's basically all those things, they kind of based on projects for clients, but based on this experience, we really added them to the distro, just assembled different good ideas from different projects. And they, in most cases, projects hosted on Acquia, so we perform tests on, on local dev instances from DigitalOcean. We do not perform tests on, on, on prod or dev or stage. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions?
So if you have no questions, thank you very much for coming. There is contact information in case if you'd like to just drop me a line. I will be happy to answer your questions or like perform a demo for you. So thank you very much for coming.